So good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to Slack. My name is Angela Anderson, and I work in the Office of Communications here at the laboratory. And of the many things I work on um, is a program called Art Meets Science at Slack. Um, our goal is really to explore these fascinating intersections um, between the two disciplines that really provide so many insights into the world around us. Um, and we're super excited today to present the very first talk in a new series called Art with Science. Um, so thank you all for coming and keep an eye out for future events. Um, today we're super excited to have Ge Wang present Artful Design, Technology in Search of the Sublime. Uh, Ge is an associate professor at Stanford University's Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics. Um, he researches artful design of tools, toys, games, and social experiences. He is the architect of the Chuck Music Programming Language, director of the Stanford Laptop Orchestra, which I highly recommend if you can go see it. I, I saw it recently. Uh, Co-founder of Smule and designer of the Ocarina and Magic Piano apps for mobile phones. He is a 2016 Guggenheim Fellow and the author of Artful Design, Technology in Search of the Sublime, a, pho a photo comic book about the ethics, aesthetics, and craft of shaping technology. Um, after his presentation, I hope that you'll stay for a brief Q&A with Gut and a reception in the lobby uh, just out the doors behind you. So please uh, join me in welcoming Gu Wang. Uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, I'm just going to dive right in and um, artful design, technology in search of the sublime. Uh, it, it's going to draw from the book I've been writing. I'm going to tell you really about the ideas in there and also why I've, I've written this thing. But by way uh, of further introduction, yeah, that's actually that's me in my office at Stanford. Um, I'm, I, I'm a computer music researcher. I kind of turn code into into sounds, into uh, instruments, into toys. Um, I work with programming languages for music. I build instruments that are also like toys in games. Um, and we perform them in things like the Laptop Orchestra. This is Slork, the Stanford Laptop Orchestra. We're going to see and hear a little bit uh, of this in just a few minutes. And uh, I design toys, instruments for different computing mediums, such as the mobile phone. This is Ocarina. Uh, and this is the kind of thing that I, I do these days. Uh, but if we were to rewind like 40 years, uh, I was born in Beijing in 1977. And actually, I was born right there. <laughs> or at least I was, that's where I grew up. Um, I grew up with my grandparents. Um, and that's like a picture of me when I was four. And uh, while my parents were actually working in like a different part of China, this is uh, during a very like a period of great change in China, to say the least. Um, and in a way, I consider Beijing really, that's kind of, well, that's, that's home. Palo Alto is also home. Um, and even though Beijing now, compared to Beijing when I grew up, has become a lot more congested and polluted and a lot of other things, there's still, it still has its moments. I still think of it as home. I grew up in this apartment. This is the inside of that building. Uh, it's a rather, it's, it's not a big, place, but it was filled with music. Uh, you know, grandfather would play a lot of Western classical music, so I grew up with that one side of the household. And grandma would play Peking opera. And the other, so there's a, there's a lot of music. And uh, I was thinking back to, like, wow, what was the first thing that I, I guess I, I consider myself someone who designs, so I guess I'm, a, by definition, a designer, um, even though I think all of us are designers. Well, I thought back as to what was the first thing that I, I tried to make, I tried to design. I think it was this, something like this. It was a brick made out of mud that I gathered from under our, our apartment building. And I tried to fashion them into bricks for the purpose of making gold. I thought I was actually like literally in some kind of wild alchemistic effort trying to turn mud into gold. Or, you know, part of it I thought the form pleased me of like a rectangular brick. And I would keep them carefully wrapped up in newspapers that I would you know, 
let these things dry under my grandparents' bed. And, and then at some point, I tried to uh, pawn them off and sell them for candy to my peers. Uh, and this did not work. Um, I was a weird kid. But as a, as a friend once observed, all kids are weird. We do things that our adult selves would consider really bizarre. And I think that's what's so wonderful about childhood, is that you know, kids are beholden to nobody. And therefore, they're really natural to be themselves. I feel like that's one of the things that, you know, as we grow older, it's, it's hard to keep that part of all, all of us, that, 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 think, that I think is in all of us. Um, and I grew up with a lot of comic books, video games. Uh, I remember, you know, we didn't have a lot of money, so I would stand for hours at, at like the video arcade just watching people play video game, and, and I love that. Just something about the flicker of the pixels on screen, of things moving, interaction causing other things happening in the game was just fascinating to me. Uh, and I still play video games. Uh, I play a lot of Star... I mean, I was up like this week just playing StarCraft, which is a game I've been playing since 1998. So, uh, yeah, in, in a way, I think comics and, and games inform a lot of the ways I think about building things. There's a sense of, again, fun and and this idea that you can kind of be yourself when you are immersed in these mediums. Uh, I moved to the U.S. when I was nine years old and lived with my parents. Uh, and you know, it, was in, it was in Atlanta, Georgia. At the age of 13, my parents got me a guitar for a birthday. That turned out to be a really good present because that completely changed my, my world. And uh, my first instrument was actually the accordion. I started playing that at the age of seven in Beijing. But it was really the guitar that made me like, it's like, wow, I can, I can rock, right? And the ability to rock was something that I, I've, I've since just cherished. And then I realized, wow, maybe I can build things to help other people rock. And so I think that's how I became a computer scientist. But you know, my high school friends were, well, it was, it was a good time. I, I, I feel like high school was much easier back then. Uh, in the in the nineties, and uh, again, in in the sense that I think we had more time just to be ourselves. I went to college, um, study computer science, because I realized, wow, as fun as this it is to play video games, it might be even more fun to try to build them, to design them. There's something really joyous in the building. And then I went to grad school in computer science as well, but. Focusing on computer music, this is when I realized I could like combine these interests, musical on one side, and kind of this 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 desire, this impetus, this impulse to build things, right? So I think that's how I ended up um, studying computer science, but really in the area of computer music, and that was my advisor, Harry Cook, uh, who I think to this day remains a, a really a mentor and someone I just channel, someone I admire. It's the kind of person I'd be like. What would Perry do in this situation? And then that usually is a good, good way to, to go. Now, for my PhD dissertation uh, in grad school, I made a programming language for music. Uh, again, like I said, I, I write code, and the code turns into things like sounds or you know, software systems that are games or tools. So I'm going to give you a quick demo of this. And uh, let's see. Here's Chuck. So, Chuck, I'm going to make a instantiate a uh, sine oscillator. I'm going to call this Angela. And we're going to connect Angela to the deck. So what we've done here is to make a sine oscillator and using this symbol of connecting it to the sound output. I'm going to say, Angela, if I name it such a frequency to 440 hertz, and let time pass for two seconds. Right? If I do that, There's Angela, 440 hertz, two seconds. Now this is, in these three lines of code, kind of embodies a very important aspect of programming in Chuck, and that is by design. Uh, this is a language in which we actually need to very, very explicitly deal with time in order to have sound happen. The observation is, hey, sound is a time-based phenomenon, and in order to control sound, maybe we can have a programming language that foregrounds how to really deal with time in a way that's very clear and expressive. So in this case, we can read this as here's the sine oscillator, set its frequency to 440, and let time pass for two seconds. So we can copy and paste this 
and change the frequency 220, 440, 880, and change the time, say, to 0.5 seconds, 0.5 seconds and one second. Now, this, by having the frequency, we've gone down one octave. By doubling it, we've gone up one octave. So this should be a sequence of successive octaves, right? So you can imagine creating all kinds of single line, single sine wave, really fairly awful, I imagine, kind of music with, in this fashion. But you know what? Let's add a loop. This is something computers are really good at doing. Looping, repetition, and precision. So we're gonna do this, and sorry Angela, when we have put you into an infinite loop here. Now, we're going to, instead of hard coding this, generate a random number between 30 or 1000, and set that as Angela's frequency, and do and have this happen every uh, one second. This is the uh, sound that you know, like old mainframe computers should be making where they're thinking really hard about something. We're gonna keep going every 10 milliseconds. Every one millisecond, that is 1,000 times a second, we're going to change the frequency of the single sine wave, and that sounds like that. So, uh, this is not the kind of music you would you know, have blaring on in your car stereo as you're driving down the highway, but you know, this is, this is code that really specifies how this thing is supposed to sound. And by the way, we crossed an interesting perceptual threshold from perceiving individual bleeps and bloops when we're at like 100 milliseconds to just perceiving a continuous carpet of sound. And that threshold is right around 20 to 30 times a second. And that's one of the few places where our auditory system lines up with our visual system. This is how movies look like they're a continuous motion because there are at least 24 frames per second. For example, so um, you can also go the other way. One millisecond, ten. We saw that it can be. Uh, you can do one minute. I'm not going to play this. This is just going to be very slow. You can do hour, day, week. Every week, this frequency will change randomly. You can even say fifty-two weeks is my notion of a year, and every one thousand years I'm going to change this we're not gonna wait for that to change so that you know so again by design this programming language is trying to kind of uh, in afford a certain type of thinking about how you can deal with sound by dealing with time and using the same timing mechanism you can really drill down and zoom into time and deal with it in very small increments at very fast rates milliseconds even at the level of digital samples, so which there are tens of thousands per second. And the same mechanism allows you to also think about time in really large time scales, right? So this is, I would say this is an aspect of programming language design specific to, a, to the domain of music. So that's, that's an example of, of uh, something I ended up building. I'm still building this thing. I've been building this thing since 2002. I thought I'd be done in six months, and it's been like, 17 years. So it goes. Uh, it's open source, it's freely available, and we're still, there's a community of people maintaining this. I like to say it crashes equally well in all commodity operating systems. So good luck. Um, and that brings me back to, to Stanford, right? And, uh, and this, I've been at Stanford now, this is my 11th year. And, uh, and somewhere in there, really early on, I also co founded a company, and that was SMU. This is when mobile phones really like, became kind of an app-based thing, and apps became a thing. Um, so in 2008, Smuel was founded by Jeff S Smith and myself, and uh, we started building kind of expressive and also social musical instruments slash toys. And I'll, I'll come back to that. So now that takes us through kind of, let's say, 2013, 2014. Uh, and Really about three and a half years ago, I started writing this book. I started writing this book 
Um, first, I wanted to write a book just really about computer music and design. Like, what does it mean to like design things well? Right? And using computer music is kind of this, this vehicle to do that. But then, as I started writing it, I found like I have a lot of pictures. So maybe this, pic this book will have a lot of figures. Uh, but then it's like, what if half the book was like a comic book? When I, and that thought excited me because then I thought, well, the things that I'm designing could like talk back. Like, we could have a conversation. I could have a conversation with my computer or the, with the software. And that's something that the medium of comic books could, could afford more easily than like a more conventional, you know, mostly text based book. And when I thought about that, it was really just like a very short distance away from thinking, what if the entire book was a comic book? It's a very dangerous line of thinking, as you can see. And, uh, you know, I was like, yeah, why not? You know, the medium should be the message. The medium cannot help but shape the message. To do a, a book about design as a comic book has to change the way the book actually is and the way that it can be read, right? So that kind of became, uh, that's actually how this book came to be, I guess, the way it is, for better or for worse. And, but content-wise, it went from a computer music, how to design things well, to kind of just thinking about technology and its shaping in general. Because, you know, the more I thought about this, the more, like, there are a lot of things that unsettled me. Especially as I looked around to the technology that envelop us and really is pervasive in many different ways in our everyday lives. Right? From the buildings we live in, to the software we use, to the social tools that occupy much of our time and, and mind and emotional energy, right? to games. that like All the things we actually spend time doing and using, they're made of, well, they're all made of technology. And, and many, more and more of them are made out of computer-based technology. So this book became a meditation on, what it, on design and what it means to design, to design well, but then to design like in a human way. I felt like that, you know, seems like something we ought to figure out how to, how to talk about, how to do, because we know when we see good design, we also know when, when, we, re when we, we encounter design that frustrate us or worse, that somehow harm us or harm, our, harm us in the way that how we relate to other people, right? This is, so this is kind of, I think a certain urgency developed as in writing this book. So this became a meditation design as a humanistic, artistic, and kind of social act of engineering. And so this is kind of a broadening of what this book tries to be. And by the way, the format looks you know, like this. And um, the entire book is like this, all 488 pages of it. In fact, I'm just going to pass. I have a copy of here. If you'd like, I'm just going to pass this around. Thank you. Um, and yeah, it starts in my office. And, uh, and the manifesto in the book is Artful Design, Technology in Search of the Sublime. Um, and it's a music comic manifesto. And here's the manifesto. We really found the first few pages. It reads, In our age of rapidly evolving technology and unyielding human restlessness and discord, design ought to be more than simply functional. It should be expressive, socially meaningful, and humanistic. Design should transcend the purely technological, encompass the human, and strive for the sublime. What does that mean? What is sublime design? Well, sublime design presents itself, first and last, as a useful thing. But nestled within that window of interaction lies the novel articulation of a thought, an idea, a reflection, an invisible truth that speaks to us, intimate and universal, purposeful without necessity of purpose, that leaves us playful, understood, elevated is a transformation so subtle that it escapes our conscious grasp that once experienced, like music, we would never want to be without again. Design should be artful. Now that, it's a manifesto. This is, this is what I'm putting into the ground. It's like, this is what design maybe could be. And stronger than that, this is maybe what design ought to be. And so the book is trying to make this, the rest of the book is really trying to make the argument and the ways in which you know, design could be this and should be this. And really the questions it boils down to is really what is the nature of design? What does it mean to design well? Not just to design things that you know, do stuff, but to do, it, do them well. And what does it mean to design ethically? 
At the end of the day, design is all about choices. And if there are choices involved, I think we have to ask ourselves, are they the right choices? And how do we go about thinking about making choices that we would like, deem to be better ones than others? Right? So this has really become that kind of thing. So let's tackle some of these general questions and with some specifics. So design, the thing we noticed that, yeah, it's all around us. And, but what is it? Well, design, it's so simple. That's why it's so complicated. All rand. Now, there's something about design that, that you know, you strive for certain simplicity, but there's something infinitely complex about when something really works about design and trying to figure out why it works, just like a piece of art that really clicks. Right? There's something infinite in that. And there's something both simple and, and sophisticated about that. So let me give you a, another uh, demo here. This is my pencil bag. Uh, I've had this pencil bag for the last five years. I actually use it. It actually is my pencil bag. I got this at a Walmart in North Carolina in 2013 looking for something to hold my uh, writing utensils. So, and I found this. So, if you can see this is already kind of a different kind of pencil bag. It's got eyes. And when you unzip it, it has teeth. Now, these are not actual zipper teeth that we can see, but they mirror the zip zipper, giving it kind of a sense of purpose. And dump out all my stuff here, and uh, this actually is my pencil bag, and we cannot help but see the face. This is anthropomorphism working in design, and <laughs> you can't help but see the face here, right? This is just hard-coded into our brains uh, to recognize faces, even in inanimate objects. But there's more. I can take the zipper, and I can keep unzipping this until we realize that entire bag is actually its own zipper. What the hell? And another question might be, why? What is the purpose of the bag becoming its own zipper? Actually, that's a good question. What do you guys think? Is there a purpose? You can jump rope. There's a purpose. The jump rope This probably is a kind of a rope in a, just, it's not the easiest one to jump rope, but you know, yeah. Uh, it could be just an emergency rope, I guess, an emergency belt. Uh, maybe it's like easier to clean. Uh, you can secure, there's a lot of things you can kind of use this for, that's for practical purpose, and, and, uh, and maybe, as, you know, I have to wonder if this was designed out of some practical necessity because someone was just looking at like a giant pile of surplus zippers. They're like, we got to do something with this. And, um, and this, but someone had this brilliant idea, I don't know who, to make, you know, to craft and engineer zippers in such a way that it could unravel and also coalesce in a sense into a bag. I'm going to also offer the possibility that the question of why and what the purpose is, is is that perhaps it has no purpose. Maybe it's just fun. Right? Fun, actually, you can break that down too. Maybe it's fun because fun can make for good marketing and can make for good, fun, desirable products. So fun could be kind of motivated by this, just let's try to sell more pencil bags by making it fun. But there's also the other side of fun, which is the side that needs no explanation. It's just fun. And that's like, you don't need to say, and for what is it fun? You're like, no, that's, that's, just, that's just fun. It's like I'm saying, I like the color green. You, you really can't ask, like, that's a very quickly stopping line of questioning. It's like, for what reason do you like green? Like, no, I just like green. You know, the things that are awesome, if you'll notice, are often not because they're useful. Things that are awesome are awesome because they're awesome. And of sentence, right? So this is, I would say this thing has a very clear use as a pencil bag. But that it becomes its own zipper is uh, maybe has, I like to think that there's a part of it that has no actual practical purpose. But yet it is cool. It's interesting. And by the way, this is a moment where I, I try to recreate the moment when I realize that the bag is the zipper, the zipper, the bag function has become form and form function. Oh my God, this is, and this blip is this moment of sublimity, moment of clarity while I was standing in Walmart 
the only moment of sublimity I'm likely ever to have in a Walmart, um, that someone went out of their way to make this pencil bag the way it is. Right? And, uh, and this is all to say, I think good design is useful and enables us. But great design is something that understands us. What I mean by this is like a, it's like, it's like a favorite song. Or like a, like a really great movie. You know, think about, think about your favorite song. One of them, right? I mean, for most of us, I, I might say it might be a song that you feel like really gets you. Or gets you at some point in your life or the relationship between you and someone else. And the song has articulated so fully and clearly and beautifully that you feel like you could have almost written the song yourself, even though you rationally know you didn't. Now, that's how fully like the song kind of inhabits you. And same with movies, same with you know, great art. You know, we can ask, what is great art? What makes art great? Well, I don't know. I can't tell you what. I, we cannot really define great art. Certainly, I can't. But I might offer that great art is not when you've understood what's so great about the art, but it's when you feel like the art has understood you. I think that in a way, is why it's called artful design, is that, you know, the question is, can design offer this type of humanistic understanding about us in the way it actually is designed and with also respect to the function that it serves, right? And so in artful design, like, we look at design as this act of alignment. We, de we design to bring the world into pragmatic alignment with what we consider to be useful, and into aesthetic alignment with our notion of what's good and beautiful or the way things ought to be. Right? And within this creative endeavor are real, rich, expressive opportunities to speak to our human dimension. Part of the, part of the manifesto. And it's saying when we're designing, we're really trying to optimize this, well, this, this function to minimize kind of the, 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 the misalignment between where we are now, the state of the world, with a version of the world that is more useful, but also closer to our notion of what is good, like what the way we think things ought to be in a in a good way, right? So that's that's really kind of the the, the tenant, the central tenet of artful design. And we can use one of my favorite characters in Chinese. This is Ren, and it's it's the character for human or people, and it looks like a person. And, uh, and for me, this character is really special because that's, for one, you know, this is, China's got a lot of these and uh, a lot of people. But also, this looks like a human, but also for me, it encodes an implicit social con kind of a contract in that people kind of have to lean on each other, not only to survive, but to thrive. Right? And I think design is like that. You have these two legs, one of which is pragmatic. This is what's useful. The other is aesthetic. Pragmatic is kind of like, how do we live? How do we get from here to there? I need something to hold my ut writing utensils, therefore I need this bag to hold it. But the aesthetics are the things that make life really rich and interesting. So I think in this sense, design is this duality where we have things that are useful, but the ways in which they're useful offer us something that is rich and expressive, some intrinsic artistic quality, if you will. And so that's why the, the icon of the book is really based on this. And I'll tell you a little bit later about the outside ring with this little missing thing on the top. Uh, but you know, in an artful design world, you know, design things are this duality. I'll try to embody some synthesis of these two ideas. And so artful design would say aesthetics is how we experience a thing how it emotionally, intellectually, psychologically, and socially affects us. It is everything beyond a thing's function. Yet aesthetics does not usurp or live apart from functionality. Instead, it gives context, meaning, and essence to a thing, making it truly what it is. In the kitchen of design, aesthetics is not the spice with which you garnish the casserole of functionality. It is the casserole. The ingredients you bake into it. Right? And this is trying to say, Aesthetics is not an afterthought. It is what you, it is the kind of the foundation with which you put into anything we might care to design. Right? And, you know, things, 
like, like it or not, everything we actually encounter in life has an aesthetic dimension. We might not think of it as aesthetic, but how it feels, how it looks, how it makes us feel, you know, those things, the meaning it provides, those are aesthetic, can be thought of as aesthetic in nature. And maybe we can take more care in actually building that. So if you look at the aesthetics of artful design, you can apply this to really any everyday object or really anything that you recognize to be design including software, including actually like policy or like forms of government, uh, to tools, toys, games, and, and whatnot. You know, I think there is the material, which is what is this thing made out of? The structural, how does it put together? Interactive, how does it operate? How does it work? There's the emotional, the psychological. How does it strike you? How does it make you feel? How does it move you? Social, how does it get you to relate? to other people, to yourself, to the object in question. And then there's the moral ethical dimension, which I think of as really this, this conscience of the design. Does it ultimately strive to do good? This is the humanist dimension. I, I think for a, a thing to be truly aesthetic, it's got to really consider all of these dimensions. For example, if a thing is useful and clever, but it exploits people in the process of its making or its use, I would argue that it's not moral or ethical. And then the whole thing isn't that, isn't aesthetic. Right? Shouldn't we want things that are actually kind of, well, that are truthful and beautiful really across the board here? Right? That's, and so this brings me to this other duality of design, which is one between means and ends. Right? This is another way to look at this, to look at the pencil back, to look at anything I think that's been designed. And where the means to an end is really the simple idea that we do A to get to get to B. Or design A to address need B. We're pretty familiar with this kind of way of thinking about design and engineering. What is the problem? We 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 implement A to solve B. Right? This pencil bag holds pencils. Or I must study in order to get a good grade, or I take the bus in order to get to work. Or I eat to satisfy my hunger. Now these are pretty, these, these are things we just, like, we do hundreds of these things a day to get from where we are to like one step closer to some other higher end, right? And uh, so these are, these are just things we do. They're not necessarily good or bad. Some of them are good. Some of them are not so good. In order to get a good grade, I'm willing to cheat. Or in, to increase profit. Our business will do what is necessary, even if it's not beneficial to the user. That's a, another classic means to an end, where you know, does the end justify the means? In contrast, there are things that are maybe ends in themselves. You do A because A is awesome. You do A because A is, is just the thing to do, right? And, uh, and this is kind of the thing you do for which you don't need to ask, like, and for what? This is kind of the, the causal bedrock of a motivation to do anything. And so, you know, means to end might include the pragmatics, the functionality, the needs, and the whole notion of work. These things are things we do to serve, like, an external need, right? On the other side, I would argue the aesthetics is an end in itself. For a thing to be beautiful, it doesn't, it isn't beautiful for the sake of something else, it's just beautiful. And there's something valuable intrinsically to us that it's beautiful. Form to function, values to needs. Needs is like hypothetical. We, we, need, to, we need that. But values are things we, we, it's not in reference to something else. This is like a deeply held belief we have about something. And this thing is not dependent on like conditions. This is just like, you know, I like green. That's kind of a value. It may not be a very deep value, but that's, it's not dependent on the situation. I just like green. And then, of course, play to work. If you think about play, kind of like what I said about kids, is that kids are beholden to nobody. Play is this thing you do that's like protected. It's a protected space and time from all the rest of life. Right? And play, you don't play in order to achieve some prod, product, some outcome. You play for the sheer experience of playing. Think about that. So it's an end in itself. And so 
If we believe something of this, we might say that design is the radical synthesis of means and ends into a third type of thing, both useful and beautiful. And these two sides are not fully compartmentalizable, nor are they mutually insoluble. There can be a unity, a synthesis, and that synthesis is design. So this is kind of a very, uh, I don't know, like trying to get to the first principle of the nature of what design could be. Um, so as a designer, then, this versus is not, you know, you're actually not striving to make the difference, but really to combine them. And it's a question of combining means and ends. So that's a little bit about the nature of design. Now let's take these definitions, think about the craft. What does it mean to design well? Right, so I'll give you another story. And this is a story of designing Ocarina, which I did in 2008. And uh, this is a, this is like a flute-like instrument for your phone. And uh, you play it by blowing into it. Keep going. So this is a. You know, that's. Oh, thank you very much. So, what is this thing? Well, it's it's an instrument. That's I guess its function. And it's an instrument to be played in a certain way. And the design of ocarina, as you can see here, is not complicated. It's really designed backwards from two things. It was designed backwards from one. I would say the experience of the person using it. I want them to feel like. You're using the phone in a different way, in a physical way. You know, usually you use these people using the phone, as we most of us do, kind of like this, or like this, or like this, or like this, right? Now, this app uh, is saying, hold the phone as you would a sandwich and blow into it. Like, that's a very much more physical use of the phone. It kind of brings you outside of the screen, and that's part of the experience. The other thing it's designed backwards from is the medium, and that's the medium of the phone, in particular the iPhone, which really since the beginning had five point, up to five points of multi-touch. It has a powerful CPU and a powerful graphics processing unit. Right, so you can do graphics. Um, there's a microphone because it's a phone. It has uh, also sensors like accelerometer, which detects tilt. And uh, you know, in Ocarina, that's kind of what we use. And so if I were to hold it flat, there's no vibrato. If I were to tilt it, you get vibrato just by kind of just the way the phone is oriented. Um, and so this was designed backwards in the very choice of the ocarina. You know, you could have designed a piano or a, or a guitar, but no. Those things seem like really much larger and the interaction more complex than maybe what the phone can naturally afford. But a four-hole English pendant ocarina, really, it just fits what we've got to work with here. So we don't have to make a lot of sacrifices on the interaction or the instrument. Right? So this is, even the choice of the instrument came backwards from the medium that it's to be implemented on. Uh, and the, the other thing I would say is that if you look at the design, it's very, it's, it's minimal. And that's, that's kind of intentional. Um, I was hoping people using this wouldn't think of this like, hey, here's an app that emulates an ocarina. I want them to think that, hey, my phone is the ocarina. There's like a, a very, I would say, like an ontological difference there of how you would think about this, this thing. One just has, is more like metaphysically privileged than the other. If you think that is the thing, it's embodying it versus this is a facsimile of the thing, right? Um, this is all created in gameplay mode. And you see, the graphics respond to what you're doing. This ring of particles light up in response to your breath, and these finger holes contract and expand when you press and release. These quadruplets of circles is really painting it. 
how you play the next note. How you do this is kind of up to you. So it's, it's like Ocarina Hero, kind of like Rock Band or Guitar Hero. The difference is you're actually, the sound is completely generated in real time on the phone. There's actually a small chuck program running inside this app that's generating the sound and mapping kind of these interactions, these inputs, accelerometer, multi-touch, microphone, into kind of synthesis parameters that govern how the sound is to sound. Um, and, uh, and you can play it at your own speed. You can add flourishes as you like. So no two playing of the same song is ever quite the same. And in a way, you can get better at playing a song just by repeatedly practicing it. And you can kind of make a song your own. That's, that's you know, it leaves an open, it leaves it open-ended for how you do the expressive part. And there's another dimension to Ocarina. Now, in the same app, you could actually listen to other people blow into their phones from around the world. There's someone on the East Coast. Anonymous is their name. Playing Oceanandoa. Who are these people? I don't know. This app is not here to tell you that. Nor does the app care to tell you that. Nor, I would argue, do you really care. Like, knowing what the person's name is, so what? You just want to know who, you want to, it's actually more fun to one, wonder. Who is playing Legend of Zelda from Indonesia? I don't know. And the only thing you can do in terms of any kind of, like, an active social engagement is you can just say, I like this. But by the way, you can't look up how many people liked your performance. You've thrown it out into the ether. The philosopher John Stuart Mill once said, you know, uh, eloquence is heard, but poetry is overheard. No. I think in this age where we put stuff out there in social media and we go back to see how many people liked it, that's not overhearing. That's just, that's trying to be heard. Overhearing is like, hey, this thing is cool. I'm going to put it out there. And I hope someone discovers it and made this bring them peace and joy. And I, don't, I won't ever need to know if that ever happened, but that's the hope. And, you know, sometimes people do find and stumble upon these things. It, it does bring them, bring them something. And this is design as social experience. And if there's an underlying philosophy to this part of Ocarina is, is this idea from Mark Weiser, who is one of the, the forerunners of ubiquitous computing. He was the CTO of, of uh, Xerox Park right down the street. Right? And, and he's, he said the technology should create calm. Now, this is a remarkable statement about technology. It's very different than how most of us might think about technology today. Today, we think about technology as this thing that solves like our problems. You got a problem? I bet there's an app for that. I can build an app for that. Or I can, I'm sure deep learning has something that we can, we can apply machine learning or deep learning or AI to. But no, this isn't saying technology is here to solve our problems. It's saying this is a statement about how we might relate to the technologies that we use. It's a sentiment and a vision an aesthetic vision. Technology maybe doesn't have to be in our faces all the time. Maybe it could work at the subconscious to help us. In, in a way, it, it shouldn't make us less calm, but actually should bring us calm. It should create calm. This is a uh, review left by an Ocarina user on iTunes. This is my peace on Earth. I'm currently deployed in Iraq, and hell on Earth is an everyday occurrence. This is from 2009. The few nights I may have off, I'm deeply engaged in this app. The globe feature that lets you hear everybody else in the world playing is the most calming art I've ever been introduced to. It brings the entire world together without politics or war. It's the exact opposite of my life. So, yeah, as a designer, you're floored when someone like uses your the thing you use. But, you know, but we designed this thing to be kind of a toy, a whimsical thing that you just you have fun with. So it's incredibly humbling, to say the least, to know that, wow, this thing actually brought someone like a moment of peace amidst great turmoil and chaos. And by the way, this is, an, again, an aesthetic thing. This app did not pluck that soldier out of whatever hell they found themselves in. It just it offers something where, like art does, and helps you just moment, if only momentarily, help you to transcend you know, the things around you just help you see a little clearer 
and to feel a little bit more calm than you otherwise might. So this is uh, so that's I think that's the philosophy. And, and at the end of the day, you know, is is noted by Marshall McLuhan and Winston Churchill and many other people that we shape our tools. But that's not the end of the story. Thereafter, our tools shape us. The things we make boomerang back to make us. And that's kind of the beginning and the the end. Really, how the Powerful design, the book ends, is what we make makes us. It's as simple and not and as complicated as that. Here's some more tools. This is a sound peak. This is a real-time audio visualizer. As you can see it's responding to the sound in this room. Actually, on the count of three, can I have you guys all make a sound if you like? One, two, three. That's very good. Let's try that again. One, two, three. Would someone like to whistle? There you go. Can someone whistle really high? It's actually really, oh, there we go. This goes all the way up to 20,000 hertz. All right, so our whistles are kind of in the hundreds of hertz, maybe a thousand hertz. Um, if you want some high frequency energy, Give it like some noisy thing, and uh, and there's a lot of it's broad spectrum, so you have that. So the top, so is the uh, the time domain waveform that's plotting kind of the 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 variation air pressure that result in the phenomenon we call sound, and is doing a series of fast short time uh, short time fast Fourier transforms uh, to bring us this plot. And if we plot the history, we get a waterfall plot that looks like kind of a landscape, right? And uh, you can play with this thing. So here I'm just shaping my mouth and to reinforce different harmonics that's present in my voice. This, this uh, thing over here is plotting the signal with the ver delayed version of itself. And this thing has no, this is just kind of fun to play with. I You can spend like minutes with with this thing having fun. You can go to the back of the waterfall. This serves absolutely no practical purpose, but it's fun. And that's Sound Peak. And uh, we use it actually to to look at sound, as strange as that may sound. Um, and then there's a the laptop orchestra. Right? The laptop orchestra is consists of many laptops from one sometimes to two to six, sometimes 20, sometimes 40. And, but it's not just laptops. It's laptops and humans and these things, these are kind of hemispherical speaker arrays. Now, this is an ensemble for instrument building and for writing music for these instruments that we perform together as a group. And if you look at kind of an individual station in a laptop orchestra, it's a laptop, it's an audio interface, sitting on an IKEA breakfast tray. We sit on meditation mats and pillows, and we have these hemispherical speaker arrays. The purpose of these, and it's very key to this idea of the laptop orchestra as we have it, is that these keep sound local to the instrument that's being played. If you were to play like an, uh, an acoustic instrument here, like a, like a ukulele, the sound wouldn't naturally come you know, from through the PA system. The sound would come from the object itself. Right? So, um, is Ocarina still on? Or is that somewhere in the... I hear Ocarina out there. Might be this. And we built these speakers out of IKEA salad bowls. Mysterious ocarina. By the way, this kind of sound is, is a triangle wave. It's, uh, it's actually really hard to localize. So you just hear it as like, there's a sound here, but you can't actually tell where it's, really hard to tell where it's coming from. If someone went, Tss, that's actually much easier to localize. Just, yeah, you can be like, hey, there's, came from over there. Um, We'll see if it comes back. Um, 
So these were built out of IKEA salables. We drilled uh, holes in them and put car speaker drivers in them. And this is the idea is that they're, they're here to emulate kind of a point source. And so in a way, we're trying to combine what we really love about acoustic instruments is that they, they have a sense of presence, like a physical presence. And so we want to keep that while exploring the, the possibilities of using the computer as a, as a thing that we make new sounds and new interactions with for the sake of making music. So the laptop orchestra to date has made hundreds of new instruments and hundreds of new pieces. Here's one of them called Twilight. Interface you're seeing is actually a uh, game track controller that's sensing the location of our hands. And we're mapping that to how we change the sound. For something completely different, there's another instrument we built. This is the laptop accordion. <laughs> It's just a pop to track how much movement there is, really from just from the image data. And that's mapped to sound that's generated on the laptop. In a way, this is kind of a spiritual successor to Ocarina in that it's, it's kind of an unconventional use of the piece of computing device that we use every day. In this case, literally turning the laptop on its side and uh, opening and closing it. This Almost certainly cannot be good for the hinge on your screen. But there we have it. Um, so I think things uh, with these tools, with programming languages, with the laptop orchestra, the, the way you actually build these things changes what you do with them. You know, the, Alan Perlis, the first Turing Award winner, uh, a programming language designer himself, said, you know, a programming language that doesn't change the way you think is not worth learning. So this is actually why we have thousands of programming languages. Each one offers something potentially different. For the same reason, we're always going to likely have screwdrivers. Because, like, you know, there's nothing better at being a screwdriver than a screwdriver. It serves, like, this one function like, better than, like, really any other tool. As long as that is true, we're going to have screwdrivers and scissors and hammers, right? And... Um, and the laptop orchestra, like by the, the way it is built, having these speakers that keep sound local to the instrument changes the way you think about designing the instrument. That in turn changes the kind of music you would write and how you'd perform it. In short, the way we actually design the laptop or orchestra really changes the music that you can make with this, hopefully expanding it, the range of music that you can make. And, you know, these are just some of the many choices you would make about design, and they compound. And this is actually what makes design so challenging. It's like, you know, writing, I think, is a form of more specialized design. You're designing really words in sequence at a micro level. And then structurally, you're really trying to figure out how you are, what you're trying to say and how to say it. Right? And where what you say and how you say it are, are both things that are incredibly important. This is where, why rhetoric is important to writing. It's the message is not just the message. The message is also how you do it. Um, and all of this is to say design is really all about choices. And if that's the case, we really ought to consider how to make the right ones. And that is why we should think about ethics. And what does it mean to design ethically? So the beginning of the last chapter of Artful Design really is, goes back to this idea, what we make makes us. Design lives with us, shaping our everyday lives and indirectly our desired disposition and character. It has the potential not just to cater to people's wants and needs, 
but to evolve us as citizens and human beings. Good design not only expresses utility, but like art, it elevates us, making us more thoughtful, interesting, witty, empathic, and reflective. But now design, on the other hand, makes us addicted and unimaginative. It can bring out the ill-spirited, hateful, and selfish in us. The things we make over time make us. Right? This is the power and the danger of design, which is something, by the way, we cannot help but do. We are all designers. By this definition, the design is when we just align the world to our notions of usefulness and to our notion of what we think the, the world should be. We all design, from our rooms to our wardrobe to things we do in work and play. Like This is design we are, therefore we design. So if we're to look at the ethics of shaping technology, you know, how do we think about these things? Well, this is an easy, this is kind of probably the one that comes to mind. It's like, well, technology should not hurt us. Do no evil. Google's, you know, famed, rather old motto by now. I don't know if any Googlers in the audience, but I have to say, like, I'm not sure if Google has lived up to this do no evil. And by the way, I will also offer this might be kind of a really low bar. Don't you think? Do no evil. It's an, it's like it's good to not do evil. I mean, but it's better to Maybe do good. These two are like fundamentally different things to optimize for, right? And so this is kind of, I think, the thesis of the ethical type in artful design is that you know, maybe, maybe ethics doesn't have to be just a leash on technology and what we cannot do because it's going to harm us. What if ethics instead, or in addition, was really the foundation? The thing you start with when you actually build a system, right? I mean, if you think about it, like, yes, it's we build systems as engineers, and then we le unleash into the world. That's, here's option one. Option two, we build a system, and then we're like, you know what? Let's make sure this doesn't actually do any harm. So we maybe get it tested, or maybe, hey, we're, let's go talk to an ethicist. And by that point, guess what the ethicists would say? Well, they usually be like, yeah, that's a hard problem. And, and but the system's already built, right? It's, it's a little too late for that. So, but if you started with ethics here, maybe things could fundamentally be different. Again, the choice is compound. Um, and, you know, the other thing I would say is that ethics is not some module you it's not a feature of a product. You can't install this into like a product. No more you can install ethical thinking into the brain of an engineer. It's like something you something you do, right? It's something you you really instill or imbue into the thing you make. And really, this other question, which I think we're not asking as much about ethics of shaping technology, is really how do we want to live with our technologies? I think that's a more nuanced question than either of these. This is already very hard, do no evil. Because our, our imperative is, a lot of it is just driven by economics, right? So this is almost an afterthought, but that's a pretty low bar. Then we can think about how do we proactively do good. But this, I think, lacks precision. It's a good sentiment. Maybe this is a slightly better more precise question is that how do we want to live with technology? Again, what is the aesthetic of a society that has that's going to have more and more technology? Right? How do we really want to, to live with that? Because live with our technologies, we're going to have to do. And this pervades in many ways. You can think about robots, you can think about you know, AI, you can also think about games. Um, you know, games entertain us. But here's a game called That Dragon Cancer that is actually about infant cancer based on like a real-life story of a family. This family ended up designing the game. Right? And this is a, a game that is actually trying to help us understand something about ourselves. And this is the use of a technology, of a game that I think tries to understand us. Principle 7, 11, and A and B. It's a two-part principle in artful design. First part says, that which can be automated should be. 
except in cases where we have things that cannot be meaningfully automated. Those things should not be. And I think the art of designing automation is to figure out where this balance really lies. Right? You know, as machine learning, AI, deep learning, robots, all these things are just they're just they're already in our in society in great, great amounts and ever increasing. Right? How, how do we think about that? And and so maybe we need principles to really think about how we, you know, up to a point, as long as it does it can be meaningfully automated? Uh, yeah, automate away. But we really should know where to stop and have like precision about that. Back to this idea of play. I'll give you an example where I, it would be not meaningful to automate play. This is something I think all of us can can get. You know, when I said earlier, play is this thing you do for its very experience. Yeah, I don't want like a robot, no matter how adept at playing, to play in my place. That's possible. It's possible today. We, a robot can replace me as a, to play. But what's the point? It is not meaningful. So yeah, I think we can rest assured that that's one thing that robots will not replace us in doing, is playing. Nor is like the experience of eating, because I like eating. Like I'm going to eat this hamburger. I don't want a robot to eat the hamburger, no matter how good it is at eating the hamburger. I want to eat the damn thing myself, right? So. We maybe could think about this. There are things that it's not just can we do it, but should we do it? If you had an app that could tell you, like, you know, how to how to be happy or how to be ethical, I think it misses the point. You know, it's it's not like can we have an app that does that? Is that do we want an app that actually does that? Do we want an, an app that actually Give us this answer when it's really actually about the activity, about the actual doing that really matters. Uh, Kranzberg's first law of technology, Melvin Kranzberg was a technology historian. He said, technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. Technology has never been neutral. It's made by humans, made for humans, and it's, it would be a mistake to think that it is neutral or that it can be truly neutral. Right? I think knowing that already gets us somewhere. So the, the argument in artful design about ethics of design it goes something like this. And the choices we make in design hold implications for our users and are tantamount to taking action ourselves, like face to face. It's saying that this, there's no difference because the things we design touch people and change their behaviors and change the way they think and how they relate to each other. If we believe that, then there's actually no difference between designing something that people use and taking an action face to face. And if that is the case, shouldn't we hold ourselves to the same moral ethical frameworks we normally hold ourselves to face to face? Right? That's really the argument. So the question of why design ethically or morally is really not a different question than why be moral. If you want them to be moral, as I suspect many of us would like to be, um, this is not a separate question. We shouldn't think of it as because I'm engineering something, because this is my job, that's separate from me as a moral entity. Right? And the answer really to why be moral is it's kind of up to you. I think we all have different answers to, to this. I would offer one that is a non-answer. That's along the line of why does what's the point of this pencil bag becoming its own zipper? And the answer may be the bad news is that there, there could be no extrinsically logical rationale to be moral. But maybe the good news in the sense is that you should never need one if you believe it's something that is good in itself. It's an end in itself. And if I had only one rule, then for engineers, as a general rule to follow, it might be something like the platinum rule. What's the platinum rule? If we've all heard of the golden rule, right? You know, do unto others, have, have, you, have them do unto you. Anyone heard of the platinum rule? Platinum states, do unto others as they would have you do unto them. Right? This is sounds just subtly different, but it's actually quite profound. And we can trace this, actually, this kind of thinking to philosophers like Kant, who in the second formulation of his categorical imperative states that act so that you treat humanity, whether in yourself or in another person, never as a means to an end, but always as an end in itself. Treating people, 
people as ends in themselves. Do unto them as they would have you do. On. Do unto them as they would have you do on. Is that right? Yes, do unto people. And uh, if you think, if you compare then the golden rule and the platinum rule, you know the difference is is it's interesting. The golden rule is like a statement of sympathy. It's like this is what I would want, so maybe you want that. The platinum rule tries to really understand another person, a person whose experience may be very different from yours, someone whose shoes you have not walked. And to try your best to really understand that I want to do right by you the way you want to be, you know, in the way that you'd want. Um, and in this sense, technology really is not an end itself. People are never means to an end. You know, if, if you look at kind of how, well, look at the products that we're using, or hopefully using less and less of. You know, look, look at Facebook. You know, if they say if the product is free, you're the product. You know, are, was Facebook built for our well-being? Or are we means to the monetization of Facebook? I'll let you figure that one out, right? You know, was Facebook designed to engage us so that engagement could be monetized? Right? So this, through these lenses, I think there are ways to think about how we can shape technology ethically. And ethics, not as just like what's right or wrong, but it's actually a could be a question of quality. How well do you do this? And how well does this technology actually bring about a certain kind of well-being? And you know, in the conclusion we can draw from some of these is that maybe we can not just design from needs as we're accustomed to doing and as we're taught to do, but to look deeper at really the values behind them. You know, the Ocarina wasn't design because we took like a survey be like hey we're designing an app what do you want to what do you want the app to do and people are like we want an app that we can blow into and we can hear other people blow into their phones around the world no there was no survey you know this is it was built out of the belief that music making does a person good and that this technology could be a goodly democratizing medium for people to express themselves creatively and musically that's it Again, those are the values, and their values are never that complicated. Right? And, but values are kind of you to go deeper and deeper to understand like why something is and what people really want, even beyond what they're able to tell you. I think the causal bedrock usually is at the point of values. It's what people really, really want in ways they can't really say. So there has to be something of an artistic leap on the part of the designer that results from seeing and feeling the world at large, feeling the pulse of the world. Designers are less problem solvers and more artists, philosopher, engineers of useful things that understand us. This is the vision. This is the hope. And this is how, I don't know, I and others feel that engineering needs to evolve into not as a thing that just solves problems and be done, but as a thing that tries to understand what tries to understand people that feels the pulse of the world and has a larger context in all of this right and that also means I think the way we educate ourselves that we educate engineers need to evolve I present to you well in higher education we talk about things like the i-shaped student and the t-shaped student this is the t-shaped student the i-shaped student is as the letter I would, would indicate it's like a student that has a lot of depth in one area the T-shaped student, you got some depth and you got some breadth. I present the pie-shaped student. If you look at one leg, it's disciplinary expertise, computer science. Domain expertise, music or public health. Music was for me, public health maybe for them. So you're applying a discipline to a domain. But look at this bar. This is what I would call the aesthetic lens, the philosophical, artistic, moral lens that gives broader meaning and context in bridging the two legs. Now, this is the kind of engineer that I think we, we need to be. This is the kind of engineer I think we need to educate. If it's just this, we're just educating technicians and tools, really. We need not tools, but like full citizens, human beings, I think, to be engineers. And it's for this reason, I think, engineering art, humanities, social sciences, STEAM, why these things matter and matter fundamentally to each other. These are not separate things. They didn't used to be. 
it's not a matter of putting them together. It's, a, it's, it's really a matter of how we reclaim this unity. You know, they sh- these are things that should have never been taken apart. And uh, by the way, I'll add the letter H to steam for the humanities, like husteam or steam. I'm not sure where that goes yet. And maybe like social sciences. So you can add another two S's. S-S-S-Steam. And, uh, I'll, and there are more letters we can add. Maybe education, maybe design. But uh, the point is, design is not just about design. Engineering is not just about engineering. Nothing is just about it. Architecture is not just about architecture. It's to understand the whole ecosystem and the people that, that live in them. So as a small effort on my part, I'm, you know, I've been, I'm trying to put this into a course. So based on Artful Design, I'm teaching a course at Stanford called Design That Understands Us. Think, Think 66 is part of the first year requirement, part of our Thinking Matters program. And in this course, we talk about the nature of design, the craft, the ethics of design, the experience of design, and the future of design. Design is defined as this alignment, this shaping of technology. And some of the texts we're using include, go back to Aristotle, Nicomachean Ethics, to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, Design is Art, Don Norman's Design of Everyday Things. Right? These are these four kind of these historical texts, and the book is kind of structured in the vein of artful design. And uh, you know, in this class, as in this book, we can have the pencil bag, you know, ask us these questions. What is my purpose? So to make my life more eudaimonic. This is an Aristotelian term that means pursuit of happiness, of human flourishing. Pencil bag's like, huh, how do I do that? So by being a useful thing and by imparting delight in how you fulfill your essential purpose, your function as a pencil bag in a way that makes me a little bit more thoughtful and that I find beautiful in itself. All of that is part of what you are. And the pencil bag's like, oh, dang, I'm really glad someone went out of their way to design you as you are. Me too. I fulfill my purpose, functional and aesthetic. And I'm like, must be nice to know what you're meant to do. This is where the pencil bag gets a little philosophical. Uh, yes, in essentialist terms, my ex- essence preceded my existence. I came into being in order to fulfill a preordained purpose. And that is the core of my essential nature and the meaning of my existence and of all design things. The car come in, comes into being already knowing what it's supposed to do. We've made a car to get us from point A to point B, right? Then it's like, you humans seem more complicated. I'm like, yeah, well, perhaps. Existentialism would say our, exist- our existence precedes our essence. That is, there's no preordained purpose or meaning in our coming to being, which I realize can seem quite sad and depressing. On the contrary, says the pencil bag, I find it exceedingly beautiful. To be born without preordained purpose is to be truly free. I can imagine anything more free. You get to make your own purpose for yourself. In a way, I think in looking at design, it's a question of what purpose is served. We actually are actually looking, it's a way also to look at ourselves, to question ourselves. Right? So as art ref- reflects on us, you know, maybe so can design. And again, this is why it's artful design. Is that I think there's, it's not just about the thing. It's actually about how the thing is related to how we are and how we might be. So what it means, what does it mean for design to be artful? And, you know, the, this book is not like, hey, everybody, go out and use technology to make art, make computer music. That's not what this is about. This is saying how we can imbue this kind of artfulness that we all maybe strive for in the things we make, especially useful things. I'm not worried about the artists. Art is going to keep making art. I'm worried about, like, well, I'm an engineer. I'm worried about engineers and how we shape the world. And so this logo, this thing on top, this is, a, this is really an Ouroboros. This is a snake eating its own tail. And it's kind of this idea that in life, we, we do, like I said, we do hundreds of things every day as a means to some higher end. You know, I, I drove my car to get here to this talk. That's a means to an end, right? I, I have a pencil bag that holds pencils. But what is it all for? And we're going back to this Aristotelian idea, but maybe in the aggregate, it's for some kind of human flourishing, for some pursuit of happiness as defined kind of by ourselves. Right? And so in some way, like really great design is functionality melding seamlessly into, into the aesthetics. The functional, the practical actually becomes something that can be beautiful. 
And that's really the hope of artful design. And design, art to be designed artfully is making an art of humanizing technology. As a final example, uh, this is in, in our social karaoke app now called Sing. And in 2011, in the wake of the 2011 earthquake and tsunami disaster in Japan, a woman reached out uh, with, a, with a rendition of Lean On Me. Now, the feature of this app is that you can, on the globe, listen to other people sing, like in Ocarina, and hear other people play. But you can also then add your voice in a plus one kind of way to the chorus. Um, so within weeks, 4,000 people joined in. You can see people across the world converging on where this originally took place in Tokyo. And this is what it sounds like at, one, at about a thousand voices. We all have faith. We all have sorrow. God, if we are wise, we know that there's always tomorrow. We all need, when you're not strong, I'll be your friend. So, something like this really wouldn't be possible with I think the hope is to design things which the user never has to notice. And uh, with this, I want to thank you guys very much for having me. Thank you. That was very inspiring and helpful. Um, we have just questions? a little time for questions, and then um, we do have some refreshments out back. So um, I guess I think we can take about two questions, and then then we'll head out. Uh, go ahead. I think there's a couple of ways to answer that, but uh, I think one of them is to is this means for means and ends. You know, I think uh, mm, the economy at some level is a good thing. It actually drives good things to happen. You know, I saw a copy of like a Dr. Seuss book at a King, at like a at a FedEx office. I was like, why is if not for marketing, I would never see this wonderful book of Dr. Seuss. You know, when I'm trying to ship a package, and I think that's. That's marketing at work. So it, I was like, wow, you know, the economy, marketing, these are things that actually can do good. I think, the, you know, if you take a design lens, is to say, how can we find a, a good melding, a synthesis, a radical synthesis between the things that really are the means, which is like, yeah, companies need to make money. They need to survive, hopefully thrive, you know, with something that's intrinsically valuable. So if you're an engineer making a product, yeah, you do want to speak to both. You could be like, how do we design products that will like sell and make us money? I think that's I think that's okay, at least in itself. But then I think you want to really not lose the part of yourself that's also like how that, what how would this thing do good? And not to do good because it benefits us, but do good because it's an end in itself. Because that's just something we choose to do. And and to do things sometimes that may not be the best optimal marketing or sales approach, but that something that upholds, upholds something of your own values. But I think the hope is you would find things that can optimally speak to both. And for that, I don't know. I mean, there's no there's no easy answer to this. Sometimes I'm like I'm willing to work so much harder than I otherwise would just because I want to find this balance. And I. But I don't have a I don't have a better answer than that except to say like you kind of like to morality. I think at the end of the day you have to choose the terms of of what it means to be moral. You have to choose to be. So I think it's a choice, and and this comes back to kind of the education angle. But that's that's a separate story. So I think we I think on one hand we're training people to be logical, to be rational. You know, and we hope that rationality is still possible, um, and that rational discourse is, is still possible. 
But I think the layer that we also should train ourselves and our the people that you know our students, our our kids, right, is how, you know, before s civil rational discourse, we need to find something of our common humanity. And I think that's that's a fundamental layer, and that's I think that's ultimately what's going to give us you know a good chance at, at doing things in in a, in a better way. But it, it it's not a it like. This is a problem, but there's no easy solution. This is a complex human problem, but I think it needs to be, we need to chip away at it, something that I think we absolutely can. Thank you. Yes. I have just a technology tip. You can um, press the button in the microphone. Oh, cool. it's like the UN. Sure. So um, as more smarter and sophisticated technology is becoming more present in people's lives, it seems that there's a remarkable counter movement of popularity for older, more analog, tactile kind of tools. So my question is, how do you think nostalgia fits into good design? I don't know if it's nostalgia so much as we're realizing like smart things often aren't smart. Right? This is this you take an instrument for example. Like actually Perry Cook, who I alluded to earlier, had this principle about instrument design that smart instruments often aren't. By contrast, he says, I like dumb instruments in the sense that a smart instrument, presumably one that adapts to me, is not the kind of instrument I want. I want an instrument that doesn't change, is predictable, because it's a dumb instrument that allows me to learn it. I don't want it to learn me. And that whole act of learning the instrument is, is kind of valuable onto itself. Right? And that's so. I mean, the reason I, we don't really have smart instruments, really, is that I think once we build them, often we're just like, yeah, that's not a, that's not a great idea, right? I think it's, it's violating kind of, it's, it's dismissing that sometimes the actual sheer effort of doing something, the practice of learning an instrument, of doing something for ourselves, like playing or eating my hamburger, is intrinsically valuable. So maybe it's nostalgia, but if you look one layer below nostalgia, it might just be us being like, we like being physical. Phys we are physical beings, in addition to, I don't know, intellectual, rational beings and whatnot. And if I were to tell you the truth, I think my brain is like one chaotic soup. It's just like, I think all of us are. It's hectic. All the random thoughts going here and there. And like an inter this mythical interface of like, hey, here's an app that can like use brain waves to be like, let's render music from thought. Yeah, I hear a tune in my brain. I want that tune rendered into like, like a WAV file or MP3 that I can share with my friends. I think that'd be like, it might be interesting, but the other part I think I would miss is my physical self. My physical self is less hectic. It's like a low pass filter on the craziness that's my brain. And when you're playing an instrument, you're engaging kind of this part and this part. And this is my hands, my fingers when I'm playing like my guitar, is the part that's kind of like keeping my brain in check in a really useful way while my brain is kind of helping to direct kind of and to also to analyze what I'm actually hearing. So I don't know, part of the nostalgia might be just for things that were just always going to be good design. Part of it is just maybe our human selves being like, hey, don't forget that we're all these things, not just, you know, functional, not just, you know, intellectual, but also physical is, is melding. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me.